Hi, this is Jim from Trek World. And today I want to show you a slightly different packaging around production information handbooks issued by Paramount for the making of the Star Trek Toss movies. In particular, we're going to take a look at Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Remember that in all of these videos, there's going to be a link in the description that you can go to where you will actually be taken to an affiliate link on Amazon showing you the availability of the books that I've been discussing. This is the production information handbook. It is from Paramount. It is not from Lincoln Enterprises. If you've seen these on eBay and around, you tend to find one of two types. These, which had the distinctive blue covers and logo, and obviously Xeroxed or mimeographed knockoffs that our friends at Lincoln Enterprises resold throughout most of the 80s and 90s. If you are a collector, only the blue ones suffice. The Lincoln Enterprises ones have no real value other than the content of the information in their page. There's no scarcity, there's no rarity associated with them because even today, people can make a dozen different copies if they wanted to and you wouldn't know when it was printed. So there's nothing tied to scarcity for value, but the information contained in these is pretty slick whether it is the Lincoln Enterprises one or this doesn't matter for the information. Now, in previous episodes of this series, we've taken a look at production information handbooks for a couple of the other Star Trek movies. And generally, there's been a little bit of variability between the first ones we looked at and then the latter ones. In this case, this follows along in the mind of the latter ones in that it's comprised basically of three sections. The first section is the standard, here's the story and here are the people that made it. Now, some of these begin with like a table of contents that gives you the full credit listing of everybody that was in the movie as far as production was concerned and, of course, the major stars. Star Trek III does not. It literally begins with a one-page story blurb about what the search for Spock is. And then over here, it goes into production notes. And these production notes are part PR and part historical record. So the first page or so actually indicates a little bit while wow, Paramount really still did not understand its market for end user consumers because it assumes you don't know anything about Star Trek. So it gives you a briefing on what Star Trek was beginning with space, the final frontier. I'm taking us all the way up through syndication and stuff as if this was new information we had never seen before. Then it goes in and it starts talking about the production of the first movie, Star Trek The Motion Picture. They mentioned that it took in like 17 million or so in its first week that was out there and became one of the most profitable movies that Paramount had ever made. So again, they're spinning it here on what a successful series this is. And how accurate those claims are has changed over the years. Generally, and most people that are involved in Hollywood will tell you this, that when it comes to advertising, the studios paint a very, very rosy picture about profitability and gate box office. When it comes to determining who gets paid as part of those profit sharing agreements, the studios tell a much grimmer tale. Oh, we didn't make any money. For instance, in a situation like this, the, the wonderful PR in this book says, hey, $17 million first weekend became one of the biggest grossing movies in Paramount history up to that time. Yay! But at the same time, they'd swivel to the accountant and go, we paid $50 million, we folded $17 million, and by the time we write off all of the ancillary charges, like, you know, the sprinklers we put out front because, well, you need to make sure that you keep the offices up to date when you do these movies. They charged off everything you can think of to these movies, and to this day, they still do. Then also, in a harbinger of a time long gone, they even discuss exactly how successful it was in its home video disc release and home VHS release. Finally, they talk about how the TV version had some additional scenes, which were then later released on VHS as the special longer version, unquote, and that they were just lining up the release for what you and I would later know to be CBS Home Video's release of all of the Star Trek episodes to a date. They briefly go on to Star Trek II, which yielded a $31 million 10-day take, which was the highest take that Paramount had received in history up to that point over 10 days. And that, of course, is David Marcus and Robin Curtis picking up the role of Savick as a replacement for Kirstie Alley, who was not in this movie. Now, 
I gotta say it, because everybody has an opinion and everybody wants to know. Kirstie Alley turned down her role in Star Trek III because she said they famously did not offer her enough money. So, there are a million rumors to this, but here are the facts involving the whole Kirstie Alley, Robin Curtis thing. Kirstie Alley was offered an amount for a certain performance in Star Trek III, and she was somewhat mortified, maybe even offended, as successful as Star Trek II had been, that they actually offered her less money for Star Trek III than they had offered her for Star Trek II when she was literally an unknown. So she said she turned the part down and they had to go get somebody else because she would not accept that. She felt like she had been lowballed, and that's the end of the story on her side. On Leonard Nimoy's side of the story, it was a little bit different. They did go to her with an amount, and yes, it was lower than what they had paid her the first time around, but the role as it was written in the script in Star Trek III had significantly less screen time and fewer lines than she had in Star Trek II. So his thought was, of course I cannot pay her at a higher rate scale than I would pay a normal day actor to come and do this. So he was forced to go out at that point and go to Robin Curtis probably a little bit of hurt feelings on both sides because there was sort of an indication in some of the bitterness that we've heard from Kirsty over the years that I think she expected them to come back with a counter offer and they didn't. So I guess that's just a news to everybody and not just struggling actors. Be careful when you try to overprice yourself for a specific service that you provide. If you have any videos, photos, or documents that you would like to donate to us, please feel free to send them to Jim at trek worldcom or submit them via the web at submit.trek-world.com. It actually begins the production diary portion of this, which I think is pretty slick. I did not even realize this kind of information was out there in the 1980s from Paramount. It begins with things like, hey, we began the production of Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, on the now familiar Enterprise Bridge on August 15th. 1983. And it mentions that for the very first time, Letter Nimoy is not only acting as Spock, but he is also the director behind the screens. This was his directorial debut for a major motion picture. Now, he had previously directed an episode of Night Galley, Night Barge, I think it was called, back in the late 60s, early 70s. But this was really his big break, so to speak. And let's just say that he knocked it out of the ballpark career-wise and stayed a significant player in Star Trek's directorial endeavors as several years would go by. It also goes into how they actually, for the first time, transferred screen to video and then displayed to digital videos on the monitors all throughout the ship sets. So it allowed them to actually do approximately 600 different video loops, which avoided the repetition that we always saw on the bridge monitors in the original TV series and to a large extent, even in Star Trek, the motion picture. It goes on into, of course, ILM shooting the model miniatures. And the remainder of the interior sets were again built on Stage 9 on Paramount Flot. The Enterprise Bridge was also redressed for the USS Grissom. And then after approximately eight days of filming on Stage 9 on the Enterprise set, they moved into Stage 8 next door to begin doing some others. And then it goes into a really, really interesting thing, which again, I didn't know. Doesn't mean this is like apocryphal information. This is just things I never saw when people talked about the making of these movies. And that is, in Star Trek The Motion Picture, they built the Klingon bridge set on stage five. And then, and then in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, the set was redressed to also service the Enterprise's torpedo room and the docking bay. And then finally in Star Trek III The Search for Spock, it's once again redressed from the Klingon Bird of Prey, to this time to the Enterprise docking bay again at the point where Kirk and his crew meet Admiral Morrow arriving when they arrive at the space dock. So some of the inside sets that were used to represent Vulcan, such as the Climax and Mount Sileia, if I'm saying that right, were also used on stage five. It goes over a few other things, but the next really thing of significant importance is how it calls out that stages 12, 14, and 15 were used to represent the Genesis planet at various stages of its evolution and degradation. It finished principal photography on October 21st, 1983, and then it descends back into the normal PR stuff. There's one section that's devoted to all the actors that appeared in the film, what they've done before, what their most recent things have been, and just what why they're here, or great actors they are. And anyway, standard PR stuff. And then a remaining couple pages, which does the same thing, but this time for the production team. Always like those kind of things, because normally, as most of you know, especially Gen 1 people, we didn't hear very much about exactly how influential and how much work the people behind the scenes were doing. Now, I said this was a little bit different from the other production handbooks we looked at because it's actually part of a press release packet 
for the first time. And in this packet, which is really just a binder, as you can see here, press information. In the binder, in addition to the production handbook, you also get studio photographs, guest stars, ensemble crews, basic set shots. They know what's going to make them the money here. Special effect shots, post VFX, obviously. The Vulcan shots, including the bird of prey on Vulcan. I thought that was pretty slick, guys. I liked that. I love the way the wings would go up and come down. We obviously saw that before. There it is again, by the way. Just to hammer home the fact that, hey, that's Leonard Nimoy directing. And then a couple more things from the screen. So we get these nice pictures. And then each one of these pictures also comes with a description for each one. So this one in particular says, Leonard Nimoy Wright making his feature film directorial debut for Paramount Pictures, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. He discusses a scene with stars, left to right, DeForest Kelly and William Shatner. The film was written and produced by Harv Bennett based on Star Trek by Gene Roddenberry, Gary Nardino, executive producer. He had one of these for each one of the pictures. This is really, this really is a press release kit. First one I've seen. It has not been a goal of mine to collect these. Still don't think it will be, but it is a goal of mine to collect these information handbooks that were produced, which means that I might stumble across another one of these sets in the near future for the remaining movies that I'm still trying to acquire. So at the end of the day, pretty good. Information again, production daily schedule information that's pretty surprising in a Paramount press release. Well worth the money. I think this was somewhere around 25, 30 bucks. There'll be a link in the description for finding this little fellow. Do you have a message that you would like to share with us and the Star Trek universe? If so, please call our user comments line and give us your thoughts. So now let's get up with the fun stuff. Like this, right over here.